a special thanks to my committee members, uh, Dr. Neri Oxman, Dr. David Wallace, and Dr. Woody Flowers. Um, I thought I'd start by whetting your appetite and showing you a 15 second overview of the thesis. So this is a 15 second overview. <laughs> We're going to be talking about 3D printing across scales, from printing buildings to printing with metal and looking at different materials to mobile systems, printing with glass, and right down to the micro scale, printing with microfluidics. So this is what the next hour is going to cover. Uh, but before we dive into that, I thought I'd talk a little bit about personal background, just to give some context. I grew up in Canada. I'm, I'm very grateful my immediate family is here today. And I went to Queen's University. I did a dual degree in mechanical engineering and film study. I then came to MIT and joined the Mediated Matter Group. Um, and it was an incredible gr group to join because I was actually the first student. And as Neri said, it was just Neri and myself for the first six months. And so for nostalgic purposes, this is what it looked like back in the day. <laughs> this is when we got our first robot arm, and this is a time lapse with our first robot arm showing the lab at the very beginning. And I, <laughs> I'm looking dorky, and I'm still looking dorky today. Not, not much has changed. Uh, my other co-advisor is Dr. David Wallace out of the MIT CAD lab, and he's also Canadian. And I've <laughs> learned a huge amount from David through his courses. I've had the honor of participating in 2009, the senior product design class, as a TA, as a mentor, and as a lab instructor. Um, I've also had the, the honor of co-instructing uh, toy design as an actual course lecturer, which is fantastic. So from 2010 to present, uh, basically my program has been a major in design, minor in synthetic biology. These are the courses I've taken, and these are the courses I've helped teach. So with that out of the way, let's get on to the thesis. So it's all based around this question, which we ask a lot, what's the best way to build, right? So let's start by just taking a look around inside, right? So look around right now, you'll see things are static, right? The parts that we have, they don't really change in time. They're mainly rectilinear because straight things are much easier to mass manufacture. We actually see our parts are usually made of a single material with single properties, right? Um, and when we want different properties, we assemble things together. We have centralized fabrication, so we ship materials in, we ship products out. And that results in a very high energy cost for that process. And that's because we have a linear scale fabrication. So if you have one machine that makes a part in one hour, you get five machines, you get five parts per hour. And that's because we're currently using factories to make products. And when 3D printing was invented, it thought it would change all these things. We thought we'd have mass customization. We thought we would have decentralized fabrication, a printer in every home. Right? And it was invented over 30 years ago, but still today, 3D printing is mainly used for just prototyping. There's material limitations on long-term durability, high cost, and it's very slow compared to traditional manufacturing. So let's take another look, but this time let's look outside. Let's look at a different form of additive fabrication. Let's look at biology. So if you walk outside and you look at trees or plants and animals, they're dynamic, right? They're, they're time evolving. If we actually look at the structure, we see a hierarchy right down to the molecular level with DNA, right? Mass customization is everywhere. Animals adapt, they're suited to their environments, and basically they have these functionally graded properties everywhere. So our skin has gradients of elasticity, our bones have gradients of density. And it's all on site. You plant a seed and it grows on site into a huge tree. They're self-sufficient, gets their own energy, gets their own materials, and, most, and a lot of creatures are actually mobile, right? And finally, there's an exponential scale. So if you have one cell, it turns into two, turns into four, turns into eight. So instead of linear, it's exponential. And this is all because biology works where the product is a factory. So keeping those things in mind, what would happen if we could try to combine these worlds? What would it look like to map out where we are versus where biology is? Well, for some reference, we can take a look at another mapping scheme. This is by uh, Professor Mike Ashby with Ashby charts. And this is very well known in the materials world when you want to choose a material. You can basically plot different dimensions and you can see basically where experimental results are and where theoretical results are. So you can know, okay, here's what to choose. Here's what I want to research, right? Well, what if we could combine that with biology? What if we could use tools like Ask Nature, which actually have libraries of biological functions and combine that? And what if we could add computational open source tools with it, like the materials project where you can design new processes, right? What would it look like if we could have an additive manufacturing map, right? And these are the motivated questions for this thesis. If we could have this map, where are we currently on it, right? What locations could we go to and how would we get there? 
So for today's uh, thesis, the outlines are going to be we'll talk a little bit about background. Then there's going to be explorations that are experimental, exploring different dimensions, spatial, material, and temporal dimensions, trying to push the boundaries. And then we're going to take what we've learned from those experiments and apply it to an in-depth project, which is focused on digital construction. Finally, we're going to end by talking about a proposal for a mapping methodology for all this data and summarize with future directions. So to start with, definitions are important. What is additive manufacturing? Well, it's when you make something by putting materials in. So if you take your tube of toothpaste, you squeeze out a line, you've now additively made a line of toothpaste. If you take your toothbrush and you squeeze out a little, you carve out a little bit, now you've subtractively, you've removed material, you've done subtractive fabrication on that structure. And if you get really messy, you can go in with your hands, move that toothpaste around, and now you've done formative fabrication because you've just moved material around, right? So you can do this all with your toothpaste if you really wanted to. So for traditional 3D printing, which is what people commonly think of in additive manufacturing, this is what it looks like, layer by layer process building up, right? But I want to also make sure that we include in the definition of additive manufacturing this, which is biological growth, this is E. coli cells growing over a time lapse. So with that definition in mind, where are we currently on the map? And we're talking on the extreme sides here. So for large scale, there's been developments in large scale additive manufacturing starting in the early 2000s, things like contour crafting and D-space and concrete printing. Uh, but all of these are still research projects and they're all based around gantries, which is the mechanism that houses it. So they can't build something bigger than the gantry. And most of them use concrete extrusion, which has huge problems because you have to use a very specific blend of concrete. You're limited to two and a half dimensions and you've got big problems with setup time. So a lot of huge, huge issues with large scale fabrication. What about on the nano side? Well, there's actually a commercial printer called the Nanoscribe, which can actually print with about 100 nanometer resolution with a two photon process. And that sounds amazing, right? You can do all these incredible things until you realize that the speed, if you want to make something that's one cubic millimeter, that's 55 hours of print time, right? And the maximum size you can make on that is about that big. So there's all these issues, right? And I'm not even getting into the material property issues. Now, if you look at biology, if you just take a, a butterfly, you can actually see the structural color in the wings, right? You get that blue glow. And that's actually generated from the nanoscopic properties. If you actually look at a butterfly wing, you can see the ridges, and these interfere with light to create structural color. And this is on a common butterfly. And if you look on the large scale, I'm Canadian, so our national animal, and I know it's important at MIT as well as our beaver. Beavers actually can make, believe it or not, dams that are over 850 meters. It's absolutely incredible, right? And they do this by gathering local materials and being mobile, right? They can fabricate on site. If we look at the material dimension, there's a lot of commercial 3D printers that are exploring different materials, thermoplastics, optically cured, even metals. But all these printers are really use, almost always using one or two materials only, right? They don't have any ability to, to grade properties, right? And if we look at nature, we actually look at a squid tooth. So this is actually a, a tooth from an hum, a Humboldt squid, which is one of the biggest squid. On the tip, it's incredibly stiff because it has to be able to crunch bones. But on the other side, it has to be so flexible that it basically is the texture of a squid, which is really rubbery. So in one part, we go from incredibly stiff to incredibly soft. And that's through these functional properties. Um, how about time? Let's look at the time, temporal dimension. 3D printing in the, back in the day was very focused on trying to self-replicate. Can you print your own printer, right? So the RepRap project is all about this. And the kind of best scenario that they're at right now is they can print about 50% of just the mechanical parts, not the, not the electronics. And it takes about 15 hours in the best, fastest case to print those 50% of those parts. Now, biology is all about exponential scale, right? If we actually look at the fastest reproducing bacteria, it's got a, uh, a generation time of between seven and 10 minutes. Now, if we graph this out, you can actually think of this. I wanna just show you how crazy exponential scale is. Now, this is all theoretical. So if every cell was able to reproduce at that rate with food and energy, if you start with one cell today, in five hours, you'd have the number of cells as people on the earth. If we go to 18 hours, you'd have, if you took the volume of all those bacteria, it would be the volume of the earth, the whole earth. If you took 24 hours, so one day, the volume of that bacteria would be 2.2 trillion times the size of the earth, right? So just to give you that potential of what does exponential scale mean for fabrication? 
So based on the kind of the background, these are the concepts I want to explore in the next section of experiments. Can we move beyond gantries? Can we actually get outside of the box, right? Can we have functionally graded materials that are printed? What about if we can become self-sufficient? Is there any way a printer, instead of having to always feed it materials and energy, if it could be mobile, gather its own energy, gather its own materials, right? Uh, it could absolutely change how fabrication could occur. And we could also adapt to environmental conditions, just like nature does. So these are the, the points that I'm going to be focusing on in the next section. Let's start with the spatial dimension. I started back in the day looking at robotic arms instead of gantries. Just like we all have arms, what if we could use robot arms to fabricate instead of gantries? They're a lot more flexible, and they do have issues in terms of, of stability, but I was able to show that we could actually get really impressive prints, the same quality as, a, say, a commercial FDM printer, and using a robot arm. We designed our own software for this, so we could put input SDL files in, and made a lot of test prints, and I've got a lot of stuff up here that I'm happy to go and show anyone in person later. Uh, but then there's all these benefits that a robot arm introduces. We have multi-axis control. So instead of just printing with support material, you can actually print using multi-angles and not have to use support material. So you can print a closed box by just turning and basically using gravity to your advantage. And we can mount different tools. So instead of just working with just additive, we can add subtractive tools. We can put a mill on. And we can combine these techniques so we can print and then mill, right? So we can compound the techniques. And if we add sensors, because of the flexibility of an arm to go around objects, we can actually use that to gather data. So this is a microwave oven. We've put on an electromagnetic wave detector on there. What you're seeing is actually the EM radiation coming off of a microwave. It looks like a, two, a, a dipole antenna. And over here in the red, that's because the magnetron's here. Right? So we can gather this data on site, and could we use that for fabrication purposes? Now looking at scale, one of the big problems with printing concrete, which we did try back at the very first uh, start, was that it's really slow. And there's problems with material properties. There's problems with layer adhesions. So I had this idea, what if we could just print the mold? Could we print the mold and then pour in concrete? And if we make the mold out of something like thermally insulating foam, you could leave it in place because it would basically insulate your building. So this same concept has been shown in commercial scale through the use of uh, insulated concrete uh, formwork, ICFs. And this has been growing for about the last 20 years in popularity. And they basically, when you make a foundation, you can stack these like Lego bricks, put in rebar, and then pour in your concrete. So these are commercially available. And I wanted to see, could we actually use that concept and, but 3D print it? So we could have control over the geometry. We can have control over the width, the thickness. And the nice thing about this is if we can do this, we can use all the techniques, all the code certification that's associated with ICFs for our structures. We don't have to worry about freeze and thaw cycles with layer-based adhesion. We don't have to worry about finishing techniques. So I started looking at this and started doing prints with our arm. I explored a, a variety of polyurethane foams and it, explored a variety of techniques. So here you can see this is a, a nozzle and basically a mill. So we could actually print layers very quickly and then we could go back with the mill to actually get a higher resolution. So this allowed us to move much faster. So this is actually the resolution we could get from a cast piece in that, in that structure. And a robot arm obviously gives a lot more reach for its footprint print size to a gantry, but what if we want more? Well, how about mobile platforms? So we started to explore small robots that could drive over things that it had printed. So this was the idea going forward, could it actually drive on things that it had already made? Turning to the micro scale, I've always been really interested in lightning and high voltage. And if you, if you ever heard of a fulgurite, you can check this out later, it's what happens when lightning hits a beach where the sand basically sinters. So you get these structures. And I wanted to see if I could reproduce that. So I, I got a, a, literally a power line transformer off of eBay and hooked it up and was playing around about 30,000 volts and found this really neat uh, option of when we ran it through powdered glass with fluid, it actually created fractal geometries. And this is because glass actually increases in conductivity with temperature. So the electricity would first flow through the fluid, and the fluid would evaporate with rising temperatures, but the glass would increase in conductivity. And that differential creates a fractal pattern, much like an L-shaped system. So I was very excited about this. It was kind of unexpected. And it created these structures in a matter of seconds, which is really neat. Um, and the, the cool thing about it is, I realized that the resolution, the feature size of the fractal was only constrained by the powder used. So when we look at it under an SDM microscope, you can see that if we start with nano-sized particles, we'll get nano-sized fractals, which is really interesting. 
And because these actually form these fractal structures, there could be applications for fractal antennas, for reactors. And if we actually electroplate them, like we've done here, I've got some examples up here if you guys want to see them later, we could actually dissolve out the glass with hydrofluoric acid, and then we have a scaffold that we could use, say, as an organ scaffold or something like that. So the developed concepts within the spatial dimension basically looked at large-scale compound fabrication with robot arms, looked at environmental sensing, how could we react to the environment, developed this formwork printing technique, this insulated form, which we'll dive into in more in a, in a bit, looked a little bit at mobile printing, some of the early preliminary work, and developed this fractal fabrication process. Moving on to the material dimension, I wanted to explore this foam stuff more. Could this actually be used as a construction material? So I printed much larger pieces, and I printed both raw pieces and finished pieces, as you can see back here. I added rebar ties so it could be just like commercial systems. And I even showed that we could have basically double curvature. We could do, instead of being constrained to two and a half Ds, we could print even completely straight out horizontally because the foam cured so quickly. For pressure testing to make sure it could withstand the hydrostatic pressure of the concrete or any castable material, I ran pressure tests. We made a pressure testing vessel, printed a bunch of panels, and then ran it through pressure tests. And we can see that the burst pressure is actually, we compared it to traditional ICFs, was around the same, meaning we could support the same types of concrete pores, which is fantastic to see. In terms of gradient properties, which is one of the benefits of trying to do 3D printing, is we could actually add materials. So I used color as an example, and I built a feed-in system so that we could dynamically tune inputs. So here's a quick little video of showing that. Here's the little controller system I made, which actuates the nozzle. Uh, you can basically swap out the nozzles too. They're disposable, so we can put in different flow sizes if we want. And here you can see I'm actually tuning it to go from white to black, and then back to white. And this is the little compressor there, which we can put in any materials we want. So it couldn't just be color, we could add say metal flakes or magnetic particles or even little microsensors, and we could print volumetrically. So instead of having your paint on the outside of your building, it's throughout, right? So we can grade these properties. And the possibilities there are really exciting for large-scale fabrication. For looking at support for like rebar, I started to look at metal as well. So I played around a bit with direct metal welding. So I've got some samples up here, and it definitely worked. We could make structures by robotic welding, but it was a really high energy, slow process. So I started to think about it again. Instead of having to cure the entire way through, what if we could cure at intermittent points of a feedstock? Could we print with chain, right? So I started playing around with this, robotically welding chain together. And what it can allow is a really fast fabrication process with really commonly available materials like chain. And this kind of stool can actually hold my weight, which is kind of neat to see. And kind of sticking on that same concept of focusing on locally available materials, I started to look at natural materials. So I started to play with compressed earth structures. So this is just gravel. And if you just start with gravel and you put it in a, a form, you don't get anything. The angle of repose is, is not very good. So, but if you actually add some fibers, which have tensile elements, and that was dried hay mixed with the gravel, and you compress it with about a couple hundred pounds of force, you actually get a really nice structure that's totally stable. And the neat thing about this is that this could be sourced by a machine on site, and it's all natural material. So we could actually digitally put in seeds as we go. So it could be a printed living wall, right? So that was really exciting to see too. Continuing down that path of local materials, I'm Canadian, so I'm always thinking about ice and cold things. And I started to think about what if we could print with ice, right? What if this could basically use snow, melt it, and actually deposit it and have it freeze? So I started doing some basic ice printing tests. What would it look like if we could actually drive down to the Antarctic or the Arctic and print large-scale structures? And it kind of showed some neat potential. It actually creates this optical uh, tool path, just like a fiber optic, of where the droplets land. So it could make for some neat opportunities in the future. So all these basic tests kind of showed that we could do pressure, that the material for the foam was good for construction. Uh, we were able to do double curvature printing. We could actually have gradient properties shown by the color example, some metal new uh, potential techniques with chain, and also experimented with compressed earth and ice. Moving on to the last area of focus, the temporal dimension, this is where I really wanted to explore this idea of exponential scale and temporal response. Could we have living products in the future? So I started exploring with colleagues uh, squid sucker ring teeth. So these are actually the teeth that are on the tentacles of a squid. And actually, James Weaver was kind enough uh, to invite me onto this project. And they actually went and pulled these out of the ocean, believe it or not. 
And the reason for this is this is one of the first biological proteins to be found that has thermoplastic properties, meaning you can heat this up, it'll melt, and it'll recool, and you can do that again, just like your soda bottles. So I did the material processing on this, ground it up, uh, added some plasticizers, and was able to cast, and you could see it holds the resolution really well. This is cast on a quarter. And then I wanted to see if we can make it used with traditional 3D printers. So I vacuum cast feedstock that could basically be used on a common printer, like a, like a MakerBot or an Altimaker. And I made my own deposition head and showed that, yes, this could work. And the neat thing about this process is we could actually, in the future, take this this genetic sequence to produce this protein and put it into something like E. coli, where we can ramp up production. And even more exciting, we could in the future take that E. coli and put it in an optical trigger circuit so that basically the bacteria, if they see light, they'll start to produce this material. So what this means is maybe in the future you could take your dinner scraps and you pour them into your 3D printer, the bacteria eats it and makes your next dinner plate, right? You could maybe in the future we could have biological printers that are controlled from the top down. Bottom up growth, control from the top down. So how would we want to control these living systems? Well, I started to look at fluidics, specifically microfluidics, and seeing if we could 3D print them. And this was work done with uh, Will Patrick. And I started to look at this idea of could we have valves? And traditionally, microfluidic systems are made with lithography processes, which is a very expensive setup. And you can really only work with one material. So I designed uh, the first ever multi-material fluidic valve and basically uh, made hundreds of them and characterized the different properties. What would happen if we changed the channel width? What would happen if we changed the membrane thickness, the material stiffness? And I characterized all these systems. And you can see that we can make it totally proportional and totally tunable to whatever application we want. So we can control the flow rates. We can control the pressures. So this is changing the, the channel width. And if we change the material stiffness, we can see huge, uh, huge differences. And the neat thing about multi-material valves versus single material valves is the deformation is constrained. So here we can actually have multiple valves. And when we actuate one, it's going to be constrained and not affect the other valves. So they can act independently. So taking this as a building block, we could use this to make complex microfluidic devices. And to show that potential, I worked with collaborators in the group uh, on this project called Mushtari, which was a large-scale uh, microfluidic wearable device. And you can actually see that it's, it's basically a really long structure. It's actually printed with liquid support to be able to enable fluid flow in the middle. And it could actually be worn. And so maybe in the future, we could actually be wearing products that have living materials in them that could, say, for example, use environmental information to report back to you or monitor your health or things like that, right? And taking it a step further, what if we could actually print with bacteria themselves? Instead of just containing it in, in devices, what if we could actually print it? So I, I developed an inkjet printhead and uh, used a piezoelectric inkjet printhead so that we could actually print living cells. And I printed e coli, living E. coli cells, and we could actually spatially control it. says MIT here. And it was able to show that, that this could actually grow, which is great. So we can actually print living cells um, spatially. So over the concept, over the, the concept developed from the temporal dimension is looking at biomaterials with traditional printing, uh, looking at microfluidic devices through 3D printing, uh, characterizing the first microfluidic uh, multi-material valve, and looking at inkjet printing of, of living cells. So taking all of these lessons, taking all of these early experiments, focused on one large-scale project called the Digital Construction Platform. Um, and construction is one of the most dangerous industries. Uh, and, and what if we could have a way so that instead of we have to have a huge amount of people doing hard labor and really dangerous, if you could press a button and it could drive on site and print a structure. So I took all the foam stuff and figured, what if we could scale that arm up using a compound arm? So just like our arm, we have our shoulder, and then we have our fingers. The shoulder does the big movements. The finger does the small corrections. What if we could do the same thing? So I made this proposal and found Alltech, which is this, the company that makes the most of these aerial lift systems. And they were interested, not super excited. So they gave me a used 2002 truck. And so what that meant is I had to convert all of these things. So I had to take out all the manual valves, switch them to digital valves, add sensors to all the joints to get feedback, and we mounted our robot arm on the top here. And the reason I painted it black is because it was all rusty. It's not that I just like black. Uh, so it has a really large reach, which is great. And you can see here's the action of the KUKA arm, and here's the action of the hydraulic arm. So we have that reach, and we have that adaptability. And we basically wired it up. You can see some of the sensors on the endpoint. 
uh, we had materials from BASF lined up to do uh, foam print tests. And in August 2014, we were planning to do our first full-scale architectural scale print. And unfortunately, we got a bit of a surprise. So I was the only graduate student on the project, and I was diagnosed with brain cancer. And that totally halted the project. Uh, so I thought I'd take a couple slides to talk about that experience, um, because it actually grounded that whole prototype. But you'll see in a second that we made a new prototype after that. So uh, I thought I'd explain it very quickly, because I know we're short on time. So this is a 30-second medical selfie of that experience. This is my family after surgery. If we zoom in, you can see my repaired skull. That's my brain. Dive into the MRIs. There's the tumor right there. And this is actually the surgery of it. This is them cutting open my brain. And if we dive in, this is my pathology here. You can see it's an astrocytoma. And if you dive in further, you can see it's actually the primary mutation is an IDH1 mutation. And the thing about that is it's a single point mutation. So it was a G that turned to an A. And this is not something that's hereditary. This is something that is just really unlucky. So the crazy thing about this story, it was actually found through a research scan, believe it or not. So in 2007, uh, I volunteered for a research scan at my university at Queen's. I do this all the time, volunteer for studies. I wanted to see my brain, and they needed volunteers. So I asked for the data back, and they said, oh, by the way, there's a small abnormality. We don't know what it is. You can see it up here. You might want to get it checked out. So I went back to a neuro-oncologist, neuro, uh, or not, uh, just a neurologist, did another scan. They didn't know what it was. They said, don't worry, you're not symptomatic. Lots of people have abnormalities. Get it checked in a few years. So I went back in 2010, got another scan. It showed the same result, so there wasn't much concern. Went about my life. Then in 2014, in August, I started to smell a very faint vinegar smell for a few seconds a day. After about the third day of it, I was in bed. I w went to the kitchen. No one was cooking. I thought, oh, that's kind of odd. So I went back to this data and realized that is near the smell center of the brain. I wonder if it's linked. So I went to the doctors here and asked if I could get another scan. And they weren't concerned because I wasn't symptomatic in any way. Uh, but I pushed, and they booked it for a month later. This is what the scan looked like a month later. And it had grown significantly. It was uh, a tumor, one of the largest they've seen, astrocytomas. Uh, it was about 10% of my brain. And I was told, in three weeks' time, they're going to cut it out. And it, by the way, it's going to be an awake brain surgery because it's near my language center. So they want to make sure that they don't cut that out. So, of course, I was fascinated by this, and I wanted to gather as much data as I could, so I asked if they would videotape it, and they said yes. So it was a 10-hour awake brain surgery, and for those of you that don't want to see this, I recommend closing your eyes, because it might get a little graphic. This is a 30-second time uh, sped-up version of that 10-hour surgery, okay? So close your eyes if it makes you nause, not nauseous. Here we go. So basically, I'm awake, they're cutting me open, and you're going to hear me talking. Great. Talk to us again. So I'm talking about how I met my girlfriend Wendy, who's in the audience here, and there they're screwing me back together. So it was a bizarre experience. It was almost even more bizarre to watch it afterwards and hear what I was saying. They, my words would garble when they would touch certain parts of, of my brain. Um, so they did an amazing job. This was uh, done at Brigham and Women's, and I'm incredibly grateful to that medical team. Um, and luckily, I was back on campus uh, one week later. Um, and throughout this entire process, I've tried to gather as much data as I could. And this was ranging from all kinds of things, research studies and clinical data. It's over 200 gigabytes. And I kept running into issues, though. To even get access to a little part of my tumor, you saw how big that tumor was, right? The tumor, if you want to see it over here, this is the size of the tumor. That's what they cut out of my brain. And this is the repaired skull here, if you want to see it. That's exactly what they did. Um, so I thought I could get a little bit of that tumor to do my own pathology, right? Uh, no, you can't. So I had to become a medical student. So I enrolled as a medical student at MIT to specifically get research access to my tumor, a tiny little bit. So this is what it looks like. You can actually see that this is a picture of my own brain that I took. So this is truly a selfie. <laughs> um, and I also used this data to explore on the 3D printing side. What would it be like to print using your own medical data? So these are all the tumors that I produced. And this is actually the most, this is the object that I've printed the most in my life now. I've probably printed a few hundred of these because I've been giving talks and giving them out to people. Made them into bottle openers, made them into tr Christmas tree ornaments for my family. <laughs> and uh, even printed uh, a full-scale replica of my printed skull. And it was actually really interesting because I can actually see over time how the skull was healing. So when they say, don't ride your bike, I could understand why, because I could see the state of the healing process. right? And we actually took it a step further. I worked with colleagues 
to look at bitmap printing. So instead of just STL files, we could print with variable properties. And I can show you these later if you'd like to see them. But basically, it's, we can actually tune this so we can use different materials, either stiff or soft or clear or opaque, and actually print them with multi-material structures so they can be really useful for a surgeon, right? You could actually, in the future, imagine medical students could dissect themselves, right, instead of a cadaver, right? Uh, so by tuning the different thresholds on the bitmap printing, we actually, actually achieve different results and see different structures inside. And ended up working with my neurosurgeon when we're publishing a paper together, which is kind of fun. Uh, so I posted all that data on my website, if you're ever curious. And I started talking a lot about this idea of could we share data? Could we have a, a share button at the control of the patient? Uh, and, and I did a lot of talks on this. If you're curious, feel free to check the website. I did a TEDx talk. I'm not going to dive into the details. Um, but that being said, it canceled the first prototype of the digital construction platform. So I got back in October 2014. And luckily enough, we had published a paper on the pre preliminary work from that first system back in the early summer. And it actually was getting a lot of attention. We got attention from the military because they want to print on the moon. We got attention from the military because they want to print out in the desert without sending soldiers. We got attention from companies like Autodesk and Google and ended up actually going with Google. And they offered us to fund us financially, also offered us space. And that was always the biggest problem here at MIT was we needed hundreds and hundreds of feet, right? So I started developing a new platform uh, because now we had money from Google, and Alltech was excited enough about the results that they offered to give us their brand new unit. So instead of having to redo everything, get all greasy like I did before, we had a new system. So this was the initial design for it. It's all based around a track-based unit, and they, Alltech also mentioned we could be the first to install an experimental electric drive system on it. So we could make it a hybrid. We could make it electric and diesel. Um, and this was the space that Google gave us. So I moved out there in October 2015. And it was me and three giant warehouses and an 8,000 pound robot. And uh, <laughs> uh, we also had uh, two new students join the project. Julian uh, Leland joined as a new master's student in 2015 and stayed here in Boston to work on the control side. And uh, Vivi Kai joined the project uh, actually just this summer, the beginning of the summer, to help, help me wrap it up. And he joined on site as well. So I. Got the unit, took it all apart, added sensors to everything, uh, all the joints to get feedback, added a sensor head to the KUKA with lots of laser sensors and IMUs to do compensation, and made our own control box uh, to actually implement it all. Um, you can also see here we added an external lith lithium battery pack, and this is the external electric pump for the hydraulic system. So this was the initial uh, prototype when, got, when we first got it working. This is the one that I just took a picture of last week. This is the latest system. You can actually see we have solar panels on here for charging. We have batteries for the hydraulics and for the KUKA. And we can actually attach different tools, such as a bucket to do excavation and things like that. Uh, so it's got a lift capacity of about 400 pounds on the endpoint. And here's actually a little video showing the dynamic response, how we can actually use environmental data, for example, ground height, to modify using the KUKA to do proper controls for, say, printing it with an even layer height. And this even works on the foam, which is what we ended up doing our large scale print. And here you can actually see for the oscillations, red is uncompensated and blue is compensated. And this was done with, a, this was characterized with an external laser system. Uh, but it was, the actual system is all done through the internal laser uh, compensation. So this is what the unit looked like. This is a long exposure image again, showing basically the two systems, the KUKA and the arm. And when we combine them, this is the KUKA, you can actually get all these really interesting control abilities. So we can you know, vary it, but we can also put in specific designs. So here it's actually printing out MIT, right? which is great. So we can use the small arm for the small movements and the big arm for the, for the larger ones. And we can really do any image we want. So this is the Mediated Matter logo. And uh, I thought I'd surprise Wendy because we have two lovely corgis. This is a corgi. Uh, <laughs> so, so once we had this system, we, we could actually add tools to it. So I developed and designed a lot of different tools mills, large-scale thermal, uh, thermoplastic extruders, uh, uh, foam extruders, inkjet printer heads, and started playing around. Uh, and it was, I'm not joking when I say this, it was literally just me by myself for six months with three giant warehouses and this robot, uh, which was a very unique experience to learn about myself. Uh, <laughs> and believe it or not, I was on chemotherapy for the first three months of it, which is not, not fun. But it worked out well. We, you know, we could actually do thermoplastic printing. So we made a giant MakerBot. There's a 30-pound spool of PLA there. And we could actually print objects. So we could print you know, kind of 
little boxes like this with the thermoplastic extruder, or even really small things, especially with an optical cure deposition head. That's my finger, finger there. And we could implement the techniques that were previously developed, such as the metal chain welding on the large scale. Uh, in terms of the excavation side, we could actually do site preparation. So imagine when you go to excavate a site, it can be digitally done, and you could use those materials for fabrication if you combine that process. So here we can actually see that this bucket can go and actually dig up gravel. Um, and in terms of environmental sensing, instead of looking at EM, radi EM uh, waves, I started to think about radiation. Could we actually, for example, let's say for Fukushima, could you have a Geiger counter on one of these things where it could go autonomously, figure out where there's radioactive leaks, and then seal it? So we mounted a Geiger counter here, and here there's actually three little samples of radioactive materials, just, just basically natural uranium and things like that. And when we scan it over, you can see the, the three different areas are being lit up, and the middle one's obviously the strongest by far. Um, so we can gather environmental data. And then we wanted to show we could do a real architectural print because it's fine to do these small prints, but to do it on the full scale is another thing, it's to show that concept. So we got uh, kind uh, backing from Dow Chemical, who donated the materials, and this is about 8,000 pounds of foam here. And we decided to stay, stick simple to start with. We should print a dome as the first structure. A dome is one of the most uh, structural, sta sta stable things that you can make. So this was the kind of rough shape that we were aiming for. And we ended up doing uh, the large scale print. So here it is. So this was uh, the robot. Self it's also self-driving, by the way. So no one's touching it right now. It's totally controlled uh, on its own. So here's the first layer of the print. And you can see we're basically using the KUKA for the small movements and then the, the boom arm for the larger movements. And it actually had a fabrication uh, print time of 13 and a half hours. And you can see that we've also added in some uh, little rebar ties as well, just like the traditional ones. Um, so w it took us two days of fabrication time because we didn't work all night. But the actual machine print time is 13 and a half hours, which is really, really exciting for us to see. And one of the neat things about the foam is it actually expands 40 times volumetrically. So by taking a small amount of material to the site, you can actually make things uh, much, much larger than, than the footprint of the, of the system. Um, and then at the very end, you'll see it uh, is able to self-drive out here and uh, back into the garage. So that's the three warehouses, one, two, three, that I was in. And uh, it was pretty amazing to do this large-scale print. We actually think it's potentially the world's largest on-site continuous uh, 3D print by a mobile system, uh, which is really great. And one of the neat things about it is we actually think that it would be code certifiable if we went down that path, because you could basically fill it as if it was an inside concrete form. Uh, so this is the resulting structure. It was basically a 50-foot diameter dome uh, with an open top. And that's me, me for scale. And you can see it was really large. And one of the neat things of standing inside it was the echoes all come right back to the center. So we could take a speaker, put it anywhere in there, and you couldn't tell where the speaker was. It was absolutely incredible. Um, and to show that we could actually do full horizontal printing, meaning we could close the dome if we wanted to, we, sh we basically are able to vary the, the nozzle angle, and we could show that we could print straight horizontally out. So this is kind of a bench that we made. And you can see that we can, we can actually print completely horizontally, which was great to see. And just to show you that it can hold weight, because you probably think foam is really, really not structural, even without any concrete or structural material in there, it could hold my weight at the top of the dome. Uh, so that was great to see that it is actually fairly strong. Um, so to summarize basically the results of this in-depth project, we developed a mobile system that can do autonomous fabrication at architectural scales, which we think is a world first. Um, it, we were able to demonstrate that it's a platform. We can do lots of different types of techniques. We can do foam printing, we can do welding, we can do excavating, we can do sensing. And we can use environmental data to drive that design. So imagine in the future, it could drive on site, ground radar the site, figure out where to put the pillars, and actually create structures totally autonomously. Um, we also did comparisons to traditional construction techniques and showed that we can go much faster, be a lot safer, and actually come in at a much lower cost. And finally, we demonstrated elements of self-sufficiency. And this is probably the one that gets me the most excited, is that we show the potential to gather local materials, to gather local energy through photovoltaics, that maybe you could send this thing out for a year to the Arctic and it could print a giant ice city, right? Uh, so to kind of wrap things up, we'll go back to that, in, that original question. Can there be an additive manufacturing map, right? And my experience with the brain cancer made me realize that we really need an open platform, right? You shouldn't have to pay thousands of dollars a year to have access to these selection tool sets, right? Why can't we have a Google Maps-like system, right? So, for example, with Google Maps, we have inputs, right? You say where you are and where you want to go. 
Well, could we do that for a fabrication app, saying, I want to make this, right? Here's where I am. Here's the tools I have available to me. Could we also then see the routes? You know how Google Maps gives you a bicycle, bicycle route or a walking route or a car? You could do the same thing here, right? You could say, here's how you do it with this printing system. Here's how you do it with this growth, right? Could we actually see what fabrication techniques we could use, right? Could we also have landmark examples so we could gather data from other people, say, just like Instructables, and have landmarks along the way so you could actually see other people's views, just like Street View on Google Maps. Um, and finally, we can actually see where the unexplored territories are, the theoretical limits, right? So for that beaver, right, we could see where the beaver fits into our platform, right? Uh, these are all the kind of ideas that I was very excited about and I'd love to propose for a future direction. Could we have an additive manufacturing map? And here's how I think it could work. We could have user input and basically we'd have a process database full of records of the fabrication processes. We'd also have a user profile network, just like Facebook, right? Where it would know who you're connected to. So it could recommend, oh, your friend has experience doing this technique. Or there's a shop down the street that has this technique. And you could have a history so it could judge what you're comfortable with. Because maybe not the optimum process for everyone is going to be different based on your personal preferences, right? So we could use that to have an output of a dimensional map, just like the Ashby charts, right? So from that, we could also take the user feedback and move back the other way, right? So it could all be updatable. Users could make entries like this. So we could have process records. So this is a process record for the digital construction platform. So lots of different dimensions listed here, maximum reach, maximum speed, power, all of these things, right? And if we could have these for a number of different printers and for biological processes, we can make a map. So for example, let's say we're curious about comparing the system size, like the platform size, versus the build size. So these dots are all commercial printers that are available today. Things like MakerBots, things like Formlabs, things like that. Um, now if we add in some of the research printers, so Contour Crafting and the BAM project, we see that they're much, much bigger, but they can also make things much, much bigger. All those commercial printers are now down here at the bottom. Now if we add in our digital construction platform, we're over here. So we have a very small platform, but we can produce things really, really big, right? Maximum print size is over 3,000 cubic meters. And that's not even including moving. If we can move, theoretically, we have a limitless scope. Um, and if we actually add in biological processes, we have to change to our logarithmic scale because <laughs> beavers and termites beat the crap out of everything. <laughs> Uh, we can see that termites are tiny, but they can make things that the massive, the size of some termite mounds are huge. And same with beavers, right? The, so when we scale it up, these are the commercial printers, these are some of the research printers, and the, here's ours, and here's the biological stuff. And the neat thing about this approach is you can do this with any dimensions. You could put in binary factors, right? You could say, I want to make sure I have a platform that's mobile, true or false, right? You could put all those in, and it could reduce this map and show the theoretical limitations. So in the future, I'd love to see uh, progress uh, put forward in that, in that area. Uh, I wanted to wrap up by talking about future directions. And this is kind of a, a fun part for me. So in the last six years, it's been a grind. <laughs> We've been, we started a new group. We had to build everything from the ground up. Had to work with old 2002 trucks and spend the middle of the night getting greasy and full of oil. And then I went to Google. And again, I was by myself for six months doing all the dirty work again. And, and the exciting thing is, is we now have a tool. We now have a platform that works. So in the future, we can do all these amazing things. So in the future directions, I did some rendering to show what could happen with some of the early concepts developed here on the large scale. And this is what really kind of excites me, is thinking about how could this change the world in the future. So let's go back to my most printed object, the tumor. Uh, this is what it looks like when you print the tumor at a large scale. And in the future, could you imagine if we could print the world's biggest tumor? So th this is what it would look like. So we've got two platforms working here. We've got the chain welding happening to give some structural support. And we've got the foam printing with the layers here. And you'll see we've got our big solar panels. And it could be flexible solar panels. So it could be stored. So these could be fully powering the whole system. And it, you know, it would be amazing to see a 50-foot tumor, right? <laughs> Uh, and if we go to the Arctic, right, could this thing make giant research facilities out of ice, right? And maybe it's not practical, but if it could do it all autonomously, you could just press a button and it could go out for a year, which would be incredible. And in the Arctic, one of the neat things with the, with the ice is you could get this incredible optical effect. So at light, you could see these things glowing, which would be absolutely beautiful and fantastic. 
Uh, and on the beach, imagine if we could take this Lichtenberg, uh, this kind of fracturing, uh, sintering technique and this glass printing stuff and make it from sand, right? Could we actually create these really large scale structures and then use them to put them in the water to seed coral reef growth, right? So imagine we could make these huge structures and then take this, mount it on a little boat, put it out in the water, and maybe, because it's made out of silica, just like a lot of the coral reefs, we could actually use that as a scaffold to help repair the reefs. Or going back to the living wall idea, and this one's one of my favorites, imagine if the system could go out and it could use a hedge trimmer, maybe it could mow your lawn, uh, or in the environment just cut, cut fibers, collect them, right? And then also collect rocks like we showed with the excavation. And then we could deposit these basically together. So we make this compressed earth structure uh, and put in seeds at the same time as we're going. So what this could mean is we're making this large scale structure and over time it would actually grow. It would actually sprout, right? We could have a living structure. And the really neat thing about this is that it, it, it uses completely local materials and it produces something that changes over time. Right? It's dynamic, it's growth. Uh, and so I thought I'd end with this little video showing what that might look like in the future. And of course, I had to base the design on something else natural, which is the fractal growth uh, of a shell. Uh, so this is off of a Nautilus shell. So uh, with that in mind, I'd love to kind of wrap up and uh, thank everybody for, for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to very quickly just cover all these contributions. I think you guys know it all. I don't want to take more time, so I'm not going to go through them. But these are all the contributions that we talked about and all the publications that I've uh, published in the last few years, and lots of acknowledgments. So uh, <clears throat> friends and family, uh, and then a lot of medical uh, thank yous, especially to uh, Neri and Yol, who are in the audience, and of course the medical teams. Uh, and then a bunch of references. There's a lot of references. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd uh, say thank you, uh, and, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>